Hello and welcome to another episode of Taylor Talks Comics. Today, I'm going to go with Daredevil, Silver Age, Omnibus Volume 2. Stay tuned. Alright, uh, give the video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already subscribed. So I already on my channel last week reviewed Volume 1 of the Daredevil Omnibuses. Here's Volume 2, I'm making my way through um, the Silver and Bronze Age of The Man Without Fear. Sorry, I'm trying to get this shot set up here. And <clears throat> Volume 3 will be coming out shortly as well. I'm halfway through the Omnibus right now and I'm loving it. So I wanted to show these off because I feel like this is an underrated era of the character of Daredevil. And I want to talk about that because it seems like the narrative is always start with Frank Miller, ignore everything that came before that. And I feel like that's a uh, misguided kind of principle. So here's the spine. Um, I guess I could show the spine off with volume one. So the uh, volume one spine They've not reprinted Volume 1 yet. So the Volume 1 spine still has the big title lettering on it with all the names on there. So that's Volume 1 and 2 together. I guess you'd have them like this on your shelf probably, right? And then Volume 3 matches what Volume 2 looks like with a smaller font. So one day when they reprint Volume 1, you can have them all matching on your shelf. Um, but not yet. Uh, I forget what cover this is. Both covers, though, between the Standard and the DM were classic covers done by... Uh, artist within here. There was no modernization cover like you get sometimes with the Silver Age where like this one, Alex Ross did this cover. They're both classic covers. If I find it in here while I'm going through this, I'll tell you which one was the other one uh, because I remember which cover it is. I just don't remember what issue it was. Um, but, and I prefer that. I prefer the cover to match the artwork on the inside. So I didn't really mind which one I got when I ordered this. Here's the uh, flaps here. And then here's the uh, back of it showing off all the covers that are inside. Daredevil's adventures into a new era of action and social relevance as he swings into the 1970s. And this collects issues 42 through 74, plus Iron Man 35 and material from Iron Man 36. Because there is a crossover there with a little shell head. Here's the front cover. Here comes Daredevil, the man without fear. That's like the title lettering you get at the top of the issues this is omnibus here here's the spine that matches the uh dust jacket so i'm willing to bet that i have the standard standard edition then because usually the standard edition is what you see underneath the trade dress or underneath the dust jacket i'm sorry and then on back you have the daredevil logo so pop this open you got some black in papers you have a great uh, Gene Colan image of Daredevil looks very kind of Jack Kirby-esque um, there. Tells you what it collects. Stan Lee, Roy Thomas, Jerry Conway, Gene Colan, and Barry Windsor Smith. Um, those are the main creators. Don Heck is a penciler for the two Iron Man issues. It's during Don Heck's long run on Iron Man. Uh, Barry Windsor Smith, a very young Barry Windsor Smith, that still has this like Jack Kirby uh, kind of pastiche art style, uh, does issues 50 through 52. So he does three issues. Everything else besides those two Iron Man issues and the three Daredevil issues that Barry Windsor Smith does, everything else is done by Gene Colan. Writing, though, we get Stan Lee um, all the way up to issue 50 and then plus 53. Roy Thomas joint, jumps on the bandwagon of writing Daredevil at issue 51 through 69. And then Jerry Con Conway takes over at the very, very end for the last few issues, including the Iron Man issues. And then Jerry Conway, his run on Daredevil, then carries over into volume three. So we have a great cre credits page. We also have a great table of contents here, telling you which page each one starts on, uh, the issue number with the month and year that it came out, and the title of the issue. I love the table of contents and the title, the credit pages Marvel puts together in these uh, classic omnibuses. I wish they would carry over to all their omnibuses, but I digress. 
What I talked about in the first volume was that they kind of cobbled together multiple of the Marvel Masterworks and just cobble them together and make it oversized. And that's how they make these classic omnibuses, usually. That's not always the case. But this one, it looks like uh, Marvel Masterwork Volume 5, 6, and 7. So this one um, has three ma Marvel Masterworks that were pieced together into one omnibus. And those introductions that are in those Marvel Masterworks appear in here in the exact same spot. So, uh, like, the Volume 5 introduction of the Marvel Masterworks is the first thing you'll see in this book. And that shows you all the way to um, issues 42 through 53 is what was in those, what, is what the contents was in Volume 5. Then you get the introduction to Volume 6 and the contents of Volume 6 and then Volume 7. So here's the introduction. This is done by Gene Colan. It was written in 2008. Um, Gene Colan sadly passed away around 2011, I think. Um, and he's someone that I've become a huge fan of as I've revisited these classic era omnibuses um, through this run and then also through the Captain America Silver Age Volume 2 run. And it makes me so excited for the idea that on the Nearmate Condition omnibus reprint poll that... Tomb of Dracula Volumes 1 and 2 were like the second and third most voted. Uh, so I'm hoping that Marvel will reprint those because I need more Gene Cole and art in my life. Um, we start off with issue 42. This is like a five-issue crossover, uh, or not crossover, I'm sorry. Five-issue go ongoing story of the character of the Jester. So one thing I want everybody to admire as I flip through this is Gene Cole's artwork. Um, and while you're admiring it, let me explain why I think that it's misunderstood that you should start with Frank Miller and skip anything before. Gene Colan took over artwork with Daredevil issue number 20, and that is in Omnibus Volume 1, which I talk about um, on the first video. And then he has a, a long run. He does not consistently, because or not consecutively, because there are some issues here and there um, that he doesn't do. Real quickly, though. A letter by Mark Grunewald. He's a fr frequent... Marvel letter writer before he worked for them. So that's one of the cool things about these letter pages is seeing the uh, familiar names that appear in there as fans. Um, but Gene Colan did like 80 issues. Um, not consecutively, but did 80 issues. And that's like twice as much as what Frank Miller did. So you think of like the impact that Frank Miller had on, on the character, which is true. It is true that Frank Miller's run is amazing and that he did have a massive impact on the character. I'm not denying that. Um, that run is great. I'm just saying that before that there was an architect of the character that should be um, celebrated. And that's Gene Colan. This was uh, in combat with Captain America. You get a Jack Kirby cover here with a great action there. Um, Jack Kirby uh, with, you know, Captain America, who he created, and then Daredevil, who he co-created, co-designed the first uh, costume with and had some layouts early on. But Jack Kirby never really did full issues of Daredevil with full pencils, um, which is interesting. But this is a cool little crossover where um, Matt Murdock is going to try to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Captain America in a boxing ring. And as hokey as that premise sounds, uh, which is, again, something that people derived with this pre-Frank Miller era, Frank, uh, Frank Miller era of Daredevil, is that it can be hokey and um, not taken seriously. It, it, people even, like, sometimes... The way they describe it makes it seem like they're almost comparing it to, like, Adam West Batman. But everything you love about the Frank Miller run with the crime noir stuff, the drama, the great characters um, that have their own little issues in their own lives and they're, it's very emotional. Um, all the characters are endearing. Uh, there's love triangles. There's drama with um, Foggy Nelson gets in trouble with, with certain things with his own um, profession and whatnot. The great cast of characters around Matt Murdock, it's all here. It's all here before Frank Miller. Uh, so I don't want people to keep dismissing this era as if like they don't need to read it um here's a great collage cover with the statue of liberty behind it and again this they all have these ongoing issues uh which is very different for the era of silver bronze age um marvel would try to kind of go away from having these issues where you need to collect every single one because the nature of comics back then was that you would go to your local drugstore and, and hope that every issue of Daredevil is there, but it wasn't guaranteed that you can get every single issue. So Stanley didn't want kids to miss out on um, these consecutive adventures um, of the Jester in five, you know, across five issues. But 
every once in a while he would allow um, these uh, artists and stuff to continue these stories across multiple issues. And again, the giant panels too that Gene Colan would do would make makes this a speedier read than usual, especially during the Stanley era. And uh, it kind of reigns in Stanley with his usually verbose and wordy dialogue. Um, but Gene Colan doesn't give him a lot of room to fill in that dialogue because this was done Marvel method, uh, where Stanley and the artist would go over a short little paragraph or they'd have a meeting for like 10, 15 minutes, 20 minutes talking about what the issue is going to be about. Then the artist would go and lay out everything, draw every image, uh, every panel. And then Stanley would go back over and fill in the dialogue. And one thing I want to know about that is note about that is that I've read enough Stan Lee comics now having read 75 to, well, if you can't just superheroes, probably like 85 to 90% of Marvel silver age. Having read a lot of Stan Lee comics and seeing his dialogue and whatnot, it, I can tell that he is inspired and thrives when he has this uh, connection with the artist um, as far as like a co-working connection. And it doesn't have to be emotional friendship connection because we know that some of the artists, especially like Steve Ditko and Stan didn't get along, but this kind of synergy between writer and artist. Um, so you think about the famous runs that Stan Lee did, like Stan Lee and Jack Kirby on Fantastic Four that went for like 102 issues. Um, Stanley and Steve Ditko that went to 40 issues. Um, I think there's some annuals in there too. Like all of those comics are great. And it's because Stanley is at his best because he's inspired by these great artists that can lay out their own pages with all that said um you can tell that that synergistic quality is there when stanley is working with gene colon especially towards the end of the run they work together from issues uh 20 through 50 so 30 issues together and you can tell that right when it was about to stanley was about to leave the book is just like this congruent kind of connection they had and i was kind of worried honestly when uh Roy thomas takes over with issue 51 that it was going to get off, go off the rails. Um, you see right here, 51, Roy Thomas takes over. <clears throat> and Barry Windsor Smith's on, on artwork. So um, when Roy Thomas takes over is also when Gene Colan takes a few issues off. I think, I want to say he was doing Avengers or... I don't know what he was doing. There, it's in the letter pages. Uh, Stanley explains why Gene Colan's off the book for a few issues. Um, it's because some people actually say they don't like Barry Windsor Smith's art in this. But I love it. Uh, I love... I've always loved Barry Windsor Smith's art from beginning to middle to, I guess, the end of his career. I guess he's still with us. Um, I love this page, too, like how different you don't get those pages in, in Marvel Comics usually. Um, I, but I guess Barry Windsor Smith said he's done with Monsters, right? That's his last comic. But I've loved his artwork throughout. And this one, you can tell it's very Kirby-esque uh, in his style. But this splash page looks like he's kind of channeling in his Gene Colan. Um, but this is all, this is a Black Panther crossover with Daredevil. And so you have um, Barry Windsor Smith working on a Jack Kirby character, Black Panther, and you, you get all of those Kirby-isms in here. Oh, there's where that image on the title page comes from. Oh, so that wasn't Gene Colan then, that was Barry Windsor Smith. My apologies. Uh, if you've corrected me in the comments already below, then you win a no prize, but... That image at the beginning was uh, Barry Windsor Smith. Um, yeah, so then Gene Colan's back right here with Roy Thomas this time on issue 53, which was the dust jacket cover of the Omnibus. Um, and you can tell that they took off the price off the Omnibus and just put that on there instead. Sometimes it was funny on old Omnibuses, uh, they would, instead of 12 cents, they'd put the price of the Omnibus right there in place which is kind of cool but Gene Colan's back and he's with Roy Thomas this time how's it going to work out is it going to still have that kind of and I have to say Roy Thomas I'm uh I kind of I do have like a love-hate relationship with his writing I either absolutely love his stories or some of his stories I feel like can kind of meander and be a little bit of a slog to read and this is kind of a retelling of Daredevil's origin story so you see the classic yellow red costume so again, I was nervous for that reason as well as to reading these, but I have to say that Roy Thomas knocked these out of the park. I love these Roy Thomas issues. He doesn't miss a beat when it comes to what Stan Lee left off with. 
Roy Thomas's relationship and work with Gene Colan is just as great. You still have that crime noir uh, drama um, aspects to it. You still have like the on again, off again relationship with Daredevil and Karen Page. And one of the big things that happens in this omnibus is Daredevil revealing to Karen Page his secret ident identity. So in volume one, um, I talked about at the end a little bit that he invents this Mike Murdoch twin character for, to be his like fake twin. And he uh, <clears throat> then has to kill off the character because it becomes too much for Mike, for Matt Murdock to play Mike Murdock, who's a completely different personality and then also play Daredevil. It became too much. It's like three different personalities. So he finds a way to kill off the Mike Murdock character. They all think he's dead. And within that, Foggy and Karen knew that Mike Murdock was Daredevil. That's what they, they knew, quote unquote. So then when Mike Murdock died, they thought Daredevil also died. So then when Daredevil starts popping up again, they're like, there's a new Daredevil out there. Look at this horror imagery real fast of Gene Colan. You can see it will eventually lead into his uh, Tomb of Dracula run, right? Just amazing stuff. Another reason why I want to read Tomb of Dracula by Gene Colan. And Marv Wolfman. Um, he was the writer on that run. Um, so they eventually find out, or they eventually assume that there's a new Daredevil in town. But in this book, uh, you get... That's the other cover right here. Issue 57. So that's the DM cover of the dust jacket. And this is the standard edition. And this has a big reveal to it. I've unmasked you at last, but it can't be. Daredevil is Matt Murdock, and there's Karen Page. I don't know... I'm assuming that the dust jacket keeps the word balloons on there, but they don't, don't always. Um, I'd have to take a look at it first. But that's the big story, is that Karen finds out who Daredevil is, and that it's the love of her life, Matt Murdock. And all, throughout the entire run, um, like early on, Karen's trying to decide between Foggy and Matt, who she loves more. Foggy and Matt both love Karen. It's like this love triangle, or love square, I guess, if you want to bring in... Um, the daredevil persona itself who karen also loves uh you get a lot of courtroom drama in here as well you get some perry mason kind of style um writing which again it kind of makes this a different marvel comic than any others what makes daredevil stand out and special is the the law aspect to it with matt murdoch being a lawyer and foggy nelson but anyways so karen finds out daredevil is matt murdoch and she has to deal with that now. Does she still want to marry and have a relationship with this guy, even though he is this crime fighter? And Daredevil has this issue now. She knows who I am. She can understand, but I don't want to put her in danger with my villains. You know, it's always the long, ongoing issue that superheroes have. They keep their identity secret to protect their pe those people closest to them. Um, so I'm not going to spoil how that ends or how that progresses in their relationship. Uh, but it is an ongoing narrative that progresses through, which is great. Uh, some people think that these Silver Age, Bronze Age stories only are like one and done stories. There is an ongoing progression for these characters. They all grow and learn and develop um, throughout this entire run, and it's it's just amazing stuff. I can't I cannot tout this enough. This up here now, like my favorite Silver Age runs from Marvel are Fantastic Four, um, Spider Man, by both Ditko and Ramita Senior, and Captain America by Kirby and Steranko in this early silver age this is right up there with with those though like this is needs to be read it needs to be enjoyed by everybody uh it has all the stuff that you like from the frank miller daredevil in here and it's i've been powering through this run and i think it's going to lead up to me reading every issue leading up to frank miller and then reading the frank miller run again for the first time in a long time uh, i talked about that on the, the first video I, i've read the frank miller run a handful of times because my library had it when I was a kid it had all the trade paperbacks and I just always checked them out because they didn't they didn't have a lot of comics so it's just rechecking out the same ones over and over again so I've read that run a number of times I feel like I know it frontwards or backwards but now I'm gonna be able to read it in the context of reading everything that led up to it and I think that's gonna be really enjoying enjoyable but Gene Colan's amazing um absolutely absolutely amazing so Jerry Conway takes over at the end. Um, he even writes in his introduction, like, go easy on me. He was only like 19, I think, when he was writing these issues. And um, how I feel about Jean Jerry Conway's writing, though, 
do does it live up to the same Stan Lee and Roy Thomas writing? I'm going to uh, leave you off on a cliffhanger for that one and say stay tuned for volume three. Um, I, like I said, I'm about halfway through that omnibus, so that video will be coming up shortly. Uh, but I do have a lot of thoughts on that omnibus run because it's not just Jerry Conway in volume three as well, because you get Steve Gerber um, writing a bunch of it too. So the back matter here, you get some uh, annual covers and some house ads. You get a unused pencil art by Gene Colan, and it's the uh, issue 43, the one that um, Jack Kirby did the cover for. It's interesting that they had this cover, which looks great and dynamic. I'm never going to say they should have picked something over Kirby, of course, because Kirby's the GOAT. But I would be curious to know the story of why they went with Kirby on that one. You get some uh, inked pages, penciled and inked pages by um, Gene Cullen. This one, so this cover is by Gene Cullen and, and Jim Steranko. I'm assuming Steranko did the inks on it. I do wish the cover credits were in these omnibuses, though. I will say that. If I had one one gripe with the uh, credits and whatnot, it doesn't have like a cover section of like who the cover artists are. And this artist never really signed. Not a lot of artists signed their work back then either. So I didn't know Stranko had a hand on this cover until the back matter here. You get some original art pages where they showed us the pencil and inks. Um, Gene Cole and Sid Shores. Sid Shores is one of the inkers throughout this run as well. In, um, as well as uh, Tom Palmer. Um, here's a Marie Severin and Bill Everett cover. And then here's a Gene Cole in a self-portrait in 1970. Uh, they did for some Marvel artist prints. Which would be cool. I wonder what the series of Marvel artist prints. Let me know in the comments if you have any information on that. I'd like to know what those look like and if I've seen all of them before. I've seen like Kirby's self-portrait self of him with all the characters he designed and created. Um, I, don't, I feel like I've seen a Steve Ditko as well. But I'd like to know more. Um, these aren't ones that he necessarily created, or it's just the ones that he had a long, long hand in writing and drawing, I guess. Gene Colon, but yep, that's Omnibus Volume Two of Daredevil: The Silver Age. And let me know in the comments if you've read this, what your thoughts are. If you're going to give it a shot now that I have, I convinced you that it's not just Frank Miller and onwards with Daredevil. You need to you need to try out the stuff beforehand. Um, and give the video a thumbs up, subscribe if you haven't already, and keep reading comics. Share this channel with everybody else. Down below are some promo codes on how you can save money buying books like this or others from organicpricebooks.com. You can save $2 off an order or 5% off of an order. That information is down below, as well as where to follow me on social media. Thank you guys. Have a great one.